Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday devotional for August 29th, 2021. Our silent meditation this morning is simply this. It is possible to be doing things right, yet fail to do the right things. It is possible to be doing things right, yet fail to do the right things. We'll be talking more about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. For announcements this morning, um, let's see. Well, of course, for most of the schools in our area, school has started. We had our blessing of the backpacks last Sunday. Um, next Sunday, September 5th, will be a communion Sunday. So if you're joining us through the internet, please make sure you have your elements ready bread and and I would hope by this point people are able to actually go out and get grape juice or wine whatever uh, whichever is your preference there and also let's see today the 29th uh, we'll be meeting with families and confirmands seventh and eighth graders to begin planning our confirmation class for this coming year so I'm looking forward to that I think those are all the announcements So let's continue with our service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. And by the way, you may have noticed last week uh, we recorded over at Salem United Church of Christ, one of the two churches I serve, and today we are recording at St. Paul's United Church of Christ the other church that I serve. So you can see a little bit in the background there. Our profession of faith this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. Let's say together, I sincerely proclaim that Jesus is Lord, and I believe with all my heart that God raised him from death. I believe this and tell this to others. Therefore, God accepts me and saves me. And our call to worship starts this way. Who may abide in the presence of God? Who may live on God's holy mountain? All those who walk blamelessly and do what is right. All those who speak truth from their hearts. Join me in the spirit of prayer. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you have shown us the truth of your commandments. Give us sincere hearts that we may serve you with joy, obey you with love, and manifest your wisdom to the world. Through Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now, friends, with sincere hearts and minds, let us confess our sins before God and each other, trusting in God's mercy to forgive. Let's join in our prayer of confession. God of light, we confess that we live in the shadows of hypocrisy and self-righteousness. We honor you with our lips, but we have not served you in our hearts. We are satisfied with human traditions and norms and avoid your liberating truth. We confuse meekness with weakness and anger with righteousness. Forgive us, we pray. By the power of your word, save us from the prison of our self-righteousness, so that we may serve you with sincere hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's take a few moments now for silent reflection and confession. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. 
Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Here's the good news. Do not despair. God renews us by the word of truth that we might become the first fruits of God's creation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I would invite you to gather the young people around your device, <clears throat> excuse me, for our children's time. And if you have downloaded the bullet in there, they can see a picture. And it is a picture of a rule book, a football rule book for 2021. <clears throat> These are the official rules for playing football. And I believe this is for, I think this is for high schools and colleges. Now, I bet a lot of our young people are athletes. Maybe, maybe they play football or baseball, soccer, basketball, archery. Whatever sport you play, there are rules. There are ways to do things, and there are ways that you shouldn't do things. And if you do things the wrong way, well, you lose points, or maybe... <laughs> Maybe even get thrown out of the game if it's bad enough. In a way, God's Word, the Bible, provides rules for us also. But instead of telling us how we can score a point or not score a point, God's rules are intended to help us live a good life. And yes, there are things that God tells us not to do but only because God loves us and knows that we'll get ourselves in trouble if we break those rules. So whatever sport you might be playing, or even if you're in band, you know what? There are rules in band, too. you got to read the notes and the key signatures correctly. Whatever it is that you love to do, follow the rules, and more importantly, Remember that God has rules for us because God loves us. Follow those rules as well. And a good place to start is the Ten Commandments. Amen. We come to the time to gather our prayers as a community of faith. Whether we're sitting here in the pews or possibly sitting at home in your pajamas in the recliner and watching this on the video. But let's gather our hearts and prayers, and we'll take a few moments of silence to lift up the joys we want to say thanks for and the concerns that we want to ask God's help for. Gracious God, we give you thanks because we know that you do hear our prayers, those spoken aloud and those in the silence of our hearts. We would ask that you would address them according to your wisdom and your mercy and your timing. Amen. And let's join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We come to the reading of the scriptures, and our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 15, 
And the note in Scripture says that this is a psalm of David. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Our second reading comes from the letter of James. Every generous act of giving, with every perfect gift, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious, and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And lastly, our gospel comes from Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Here end our readings for this morning. Our message today is entitled, Knowing 
and doing the right thing. Please join me for a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Our daughter Martha likes to tell the story of a misadventure at her job back when she was still well enough to work. Her boss asked her to assemble a gift basket for a client and gave her a very particular list of goodies to go in that basket. So off she went, going to this store for this and that store for that. And oh, by the way, the basket had to be completed and delivered to the client before close of day, that day. Well, from store to store, Martha went and finally got everything she needed. And yes, indeed, just before the client's office closed for the day, she proudly delivered the gift basket. (laughs) But guess what? Turns out the client had two offices, and she was supposed to have delivered it to the other office. (sighs) Now, the point of the story going along with today's silent meditation, is that you can do everything right, but still not do the right thing. Martha had followed the instructions to a T, but still ended up not completing her task that day because she went to the wrong office. How frustrating. I think we do this a lot in life. Maybe we follow the assembly instructions for something. We follow them perfectly, only to find out the instructions were for a different model. And that explains why we have some parts left over. Or maybe we have a computer problem, and we decide that we're going to watch a YouTube DIY video, because certainly that'll walk us through it, and we can fix it. Well, we follow everything the video tells us, only to find out they were talking about a different version of software. And that explains why we now have the blue screen of death on our computer screen. In our Gospel reading, we see Jesus pointing out this same problem. People who do everything right, yet fail to do the right thing. In this reading, the religious leaders criticized Jesus' followers for not following certain rituals. In particular, and you got to remember, this was centuries before modern hygiene practices. Well, the Jewish people were rather unique among ancient peoples in that they thoroughly washed their hands and cooking utensils too, and food, before eating. But again, remember, back then, they didn't know about germs and things like that. This was a ritual, not a health practice. Anyhow, the religious leaders catch Jesus' followers eating without washing their hands, which was a ritualistic no-no. And they call him out on it, saying, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? After all, Every good Jewish person knows the rules, so why don't Jesus' disciples follow them? Well, instead of sheepishly apologizing for his followers' lack of ritualistic correctness, oh, sorry, 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 oh no, Jesus points the finger right back at them. He calls them hypocrites and straight out accuses them of abandoning the commandment of God and holding to human tradition. And of course, Jesus is right about this. Over the centuries, Jewish traditions had multiplied in many different ways. And at least for these leaders, Jesus can see that they might say they love and praise God, but their hearts are not in it. And now let me be clear about something here. There's nothing wrong with human traditions. Then, as now, there are rituals that add beauty and grace to a time of worship. And there are nice little daily rituals that people do to keep themselves grounded in their faith. 
Like when Martin Luther, 500 years ago, said that every time he washed his face in the morning, he reminded himself that he was a baptized child of God. These are nice. Traditions can be very helpful. But the danger comes when the traditions, the rituals, start to replace the original spirit and fire of personal faith. Or when a rushed, memorized prayer starts to replace the deep, silent prayer of the heart in one's alone time with God. Well, that is precisely what concerned Jesus that day. These leaders who professed to know so much about God, they had gotten lost in their, in their rituals and had totally forgotten about the real, true, living God they were supposed to be serving. The letter of James makes a similar point. In a familiar passage, James takes his supposedly religious fellow Christians to task. I am guessing that James had heard some stories about whichever local group of Christians he was writing to. And he, just like Jesus before him, has to point out his fellow believers' hypocrisy. Elsewhere in his letter, he gives the example of a well-meaning Christian giving words of comfort to someone who desperately needs food and clothing and shelter. Yeah, yes, they give words of comfort, but they don't offer to actually do anything for the poor person's situation. So this is why James says, and maybe he even shouts it, he says to his readers, be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Or maybe you know James's more famous quote, Faith without works is dead. This is the same thing Jesus was saying in the gospel reading. You see, if a believer's heart is not in it, if they recite prayers without thinking about what they say, if they offer nice words to someone but don't provide real help when it's needed, then it's all for nothing. There is no real living faith there. This is why James says that those who only hear God's word but do not act on it, well, they actually deceive themselves. They might think that they are good and holy and righteous. They might think they are following all the rules and doing everything exactly right. But if they don't put their faith into practice, then they have failed to do the right thing. James even gives a very practical example, something that was much needed back in the day in a culture without social agencies like we have today, where widows and orphans had few legal protections and even fewer acceptable financial options to support themselves. James says very simply that true religion, genuine faith, would not neglect these people in need. Instead, a faith-filled believer would act. They would, as James says, care for orphans and widows in their distress. And that would be doing the right thing. Well, what about us? Do we find that we sometimes do everything right? Follow the rules, observe the rituals, recite the prayers... But at the end of the day, if we're honest with ourselves, we find that we have not done the right thing. I think this happens to all of us. And I will be honest here. I am guilty sometimes of running through the Lord's Prayer in my morning prayer time because I've got to rush off to this or that. Now, most of the time, I do indeed think about what I'm saying. But not always. And you know what? I bet I'm not alone in this. Or what about rituals, especially here at church? For example, I'm going to turn around here for a second. Okay, the candle's up there. I'm not particularly concerned 
if the acolyte lights and extinguishes the candles in the right order or not. And I'll let you in on a secret. There is no one way to do this. There are different traditions that give different instructions, all with their own very nice symbolism and meaning. And I think that's fine. As long as the candles get lit and put out afterwards and nobody starts a fire, it's good. Okay, it is definitely nicer if the traditional way of doing them is followed. But if not, it's not the end of the world. By the way, if you are an acolyte, please don't get paranoid over this. But you know, for some people, even a little tradition like how we light the candles can be a big deal. And I know people, no, not at either of our churches, but I know people who will sit in church fussing and fuming all through the service because the acolyte made a mistake. Now, isn't that silly? What an incredible waste of time. And these people put themselves into such a snit that they can't really participate in worship. All the prayers, the songs, the sermon, they probably don't even hear them because they're so focused on a tradition gone awry. And guess what? In their self-righteous anger, they deceive themselves. They think they're being all holy and righteous because they're concerned about how the candles get lit. But in fact, they are letting their anger fester. And they're judging other people. And worse still, people who do something like this, they risk snuffing out their own living faith replacing it with traditions for tradition's sake. They also get an unhealthy case of self-righteousness. But again, how are we doing on this score? Do we keep our faith foremost and simply appreciate the traditions that we follow? Or have we switched things up, putting traditions first and gradually forgetting about our faith? And do we simply say nice words and express concern about others' difficulties? Or do we put our money where our mouth is and help them in their time of need, doing what, they, what we can for them? I hope and pray that we are doers of the Word of God. And I hope and pray that we try to do the right thing even if we don't always do things right. Amen. We come to our time of dedicating our offerings, and as always, we are grateful for the support that we receive here in church and sometimes from folks watching from afar. It all goes to support the ministries of our church. And as we think about gathering them together, let us join in our offertory response. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy God, receive these gifts for the work of your church. With these gifts, we dedicate ourselves to live in the truth of your word and follow your commandments with sincere hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our commission is a litany printed in the bulletin. Go in peace to love and serve. We go in the name of Christ. Now may the blessing of God be with you, the love of Jesus fill you, and the power of the Holy Spirit sustain you, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>